Okay. Well, Happy New Year, all. May God bless you on this upcoming year with presence, power, and provision. Yes. Happy New Year! Happy New Year. I want to thank all those who did so much to uh, advance God's purposes for this church this year. And words cannot express on the staff, my wife, and myself. Gratitude for all that we've accomplished. Many people have done so much, and we still have much more to do. Um, the building still has some issues we'll be contending with. We're going to have to um, address in this upcoming year. We'll let some more things into the budget, but we're excited about it. And we believe that God can do it because God does all things well. Amen. So, Lord God, as we come before you and start this new year, we would ask that you be mightily like never before. Open up the windows of heaven and pour us out your presence. Save souls, move mountains, and send your miraculous power to those in need. In Jesus' name. Now, since we are in our series on priorities, I spoke partly on New Year's, and we lost half the folks, uh, on the importance of accepting our sonship this year. Both males and females are sons of God, and we address that since sons have received the word and carry the lineage of their father. We also said that we are to be sheep, in that the sheep know the shepherd's voice, the tone, the nuance. Flavor, the, the meter, the heart, the intention. But this year we must become or take on these characteristics of sonship and being sheep as we embrace 2016. I know that if my wife were to send me an email and another woman were to send me an email, I could distinguish between the two by the letter or by the words used, by the tone, by perhaps certain references. And this is one of the problems with people today in that they don't understand or they struggle to hear the true voice of God because they're not on an intimacy level where they could tell the difference between what's false and what's true. Just because there are words on a page does not necessarily mean that those words have true meaning until you know part of the one who wrote it. Amen? And so it's going to be very important that as we start off this year that we get into knowing God's heart and a level of a son and being able to distinguish the tones as a sheep. Because if you call a sheep and uh, you are their shepherd and you've raised them since they were very small, um, they'll come to you. But if another person calls them, they don't. I know my dogs, when I take people out hunting with me, they'll try to direct my dogs and my dogs will ignore them because they, of course, understand who owns them. And so there is an understanding of ownership. And that position of obedience that comes from an understanding that that who owns you or he who owns you actually has your best interest at heart and is trying to direct you instead of fighting against the very purposes you were created to have and you're with me. So the question is, how do we become a sheep, a son? And that's what we're going to be looking at today. We're going to be closing our service a little differently also. In the end, I'll be directing you to come forward. We'll have communion. And then after communion, after everyone that uh, wants communion to serve, then we'll close in prayer. We ask that you don't move around. There are some things that we have to look at in our church this year. The prophetic is not moving at the level that um, I believe we need to be doing, and so we're going to be working on that. We're going to be opening up some opportunities for activation. Pastor Cheryl will be coming out and speaking on that very soon. Um, and so there's going to be a lot of things that are going to shift the flux. I think we're at a place of stability. And we've been doing well, but God says it's time for a change. So we're going to be looking to do that in this upcoming year. So prepare yourself for something different. With that, turn me to 2 Peter 1. 2 Peter 1, 16 through 20. Also keep in prayer, Bianca is not well with the children. That's why Shelby's not here with us. Her family is under attack. This needs to be going around. 2 Peter 1, 16 through 21. And Peter says, But we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. So he's saying we actually saw him. And I think one of the important things that we're going to have to experience in this church is these types of supernatural encounters where we can speak from an it happened to me, not I read about it or I heard about it from Dr. Phil. Oh, you know what I'm saying? A lot of folks like to come from that perspective. Well, I heard that somebody said from somebody. 
I think God is tired of being experienced in the third person and wants to be in a position in which he can intimately interact with us, not I've heard, but actually I've experienced, so that you're speaking from your experience, because no one can talk you out of your experience. I remember when I went to my credentials with the denomination I was a part of, and they said, what if we say, and these were big wig men with education, uh, if we say we don't feel that you're called to the ministry, I'll say, well, then perhaps you haven't really heard from God or you're not saved because I know what I've experienced and no matter what you say, I'm going to do exactly what he said because, of course, I answer to him and not to you. And they kind of sat back and didn't expect that response and they said, give this man his papers. He's obviously crazy enough to be a pastor. And so there is a level of understanding of, <clears throat> anyways, you, you're going to have to come to a point of crazy is what I'm trying to tell you where you can actually say, I know in whom I believe in, because I've met him. You can tell me what you think you know, but I can tell you who I know, because I know him personally. There is a personal relationship that he's looking for that goes beyond religious and into something that takes you past what you're comfortable with, and into something that you actually become comfortable with as you experience him more and more and more. Are you with me? So he says this in verse 17. For he has received from God... Uh, the Father, honor and glory, when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, that is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And so being able to hear his voice is going to be essential. How many people have never really heard him in an audible voice? Has anyone not heard him in an audible voice? Right. How about have you heard him on an inner voice? How about you heard him but you just ignored him? All right, the rest of you people can raise your hands. I want to cover everyone. I don't want to exclude any. You know how we are here at this church. Now, and he says this, And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in a holy mount. We have also a more sure word, a prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed as unto the light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arises in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Now today's focus is on embracing God's word first. This is our thing. We're in this series on priorities. For God demands, say demands, that he, put, that he be put first in our lives, lest we become stamped with the sin of idol worship. Anything that you put in front of God that is not God is therefore an idol, and you are an idol worship. If it is your career, your person, your family, your job, whatever. God must take preeminence. He must be Lord, King, and Savior. Because if he is not Lord and King, he cannot be your Savior. So there is no point in trying to get saved if he is not going to be the Lord of your life because you're wasting your time. He don't work like that. I tell you that he don't work. He don't work. Now what gives the right, though, for God to demand anything of us? Number one, if you're not saved, his demand may seem a bit out of place and harsh. Not lining up with the theology of life, but in reality, he's the one who keeps your heart beating. I am fascinated by the arrogance of the human being who is made of clay and eventually turns into dust, but he has the audacity to tell God who created him that he has a problem with his must. You know what I'm saying? You know, God can say what he wants to say because he's good. And when you get your mind around who's the boss, life becomes a lot easier. Can I get an amen from anybody? Amen. If you're saved, his demand is supposed to not be grievous, but the saved person, the born again, the true believer, understands that like my father would demand when I held his hand crossing the street, a child, God will demand of us to hold on to his hand in danger when we are in a place where there is a propensity for being wounded. He will demand that we hold on to him. Well, guess what? This world is dangerous. As soon as you get out of bed, who knows what you're doing? That's why I say we should all just stay in bed as much as we can. That's anyone, Monday's coming. Anyone like to sleep in? Do we have sleep in people? Are you slackers? God lays out a program of life and how it's supposed to go in his word. And it's up to us to read the scriptures, follow his direction, and not ad lib as we go along the way. For this confusion in the story, the theme that gets played out, deludes the idea of what is written by the writer and why people get confused. You know, I was listening to some people talk, and they weren't Christians, and they were talking about the media and how the church should be, and I was fascinated. I'm thinking, how do you know what the church is supposed to be like? If you have not read this book, you have not met the writer, and you have no commitment to him, how can you tell the church what the church is supposed to be like 
if you don't know what the church is supposed to be like. See, we're here to change society. Society doesn't change the church. But in order for us to make any sort of change and leave an indelible mark, you have to know the writer at a level that gives you power. And if you don't have that power in your life, perhaps you don't really know the writer as well as you say you do. So we're going to look at that a little bit further today. Turn me to 2 Peter 1.16. He starts off and he says, For we have not delivered, <laughs> you're not, we have not followed cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we are eyewitnesses. For when we received the honor and glory from God the Father, such as the utterance that was made by his majestic glory, this my beloved Son, whom I am well pleased, and he ourselves have heard his utterance made from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. Now, he keeps bringing reference to this holy mountain. We're going to get into this. The Apostle Peter is telling us of an encounter that, we, that he had with Jesus in Matthew 17, 1 through 8. Now, two figures appeared on the mount of Jesus. Does anyone know who they were? Moses and Elijah. Good. Moses represented the law. Elijah represented the prophetic. Now, the Bible says that God speaks through two avenues on the regular. Those are the two, the word of God and the prophetic. And these two figures are mentioned later in Matthew 22, which they were then referenced to the Shema Israel out of Deuteronomy 6. For when Jesus was asked what was the greatest of all commandments, he quoted the Shema in Matthew 22, 40. And he says, on these two commandments hang all the law, Moses, and the prophets, right. Elijah. Right. You follow me? So to love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your might, and to love your neighbor as yourself is what Jesus had. These two, now watch this. If you're to love the Lord with all your soul, with all your heart, and with all your might, Moses, alone, and your neighbor. So by pro prophesying to your neighbor, you're expressing the love of God by being an example to that person of God's ability to speak to them. See how you follow me? Oh, y'all going to have to get deeper at Starbucks before you've done that. He's trying to show us that these two have to coincide. There are churches which are big on the prophetic, and they like to do a lot of prophecy and charismatic and what have you, but they are light on the word. And so what happens is they become very fluffy. They're kind of like cotton candy, and they don't build any stability. Then there are people who are big on the law and on the book, but they don't really express the love or the supernatural of God, and so they become kind of dry. And we'll look at these two in just a moment. So the law and the prophets, Moses and Elijah, two men who God took off the earth, instead of let them die naturally and have men make monuments out of them, are who appears. See, if Moses would have died, he was so revered by the Jews that they would have set up a memorial for him and people would have come and worshipped him instead of the God who sent him. Okay, Kind of like the Muslims do with Muhammad, not supposedly he being a messenger of Allah, God, but they actually have a worship for him because people have a propensity to grab onto that which they are familiar with. And since most people do not want to get familiar with God, they will get familiar with whoever is prophesying to them from God. Yeah. Now, they did this to Moses because when Moses said, let's all go up to the mountain, they said, hold up, wait a minute. Yeah. <laughs> that, that mountain is on fire and there's lightning and storming. Uh, you, you go on head on, and then you tell us what God said. We got you back, way back here. Right. Because they knew if they were impure and they went up to that mountain, they'd be killed. And so they said, we're going to always be a little bit impure. We're not really going to press into God. So what we'll do is we'll let you, being a human being, go up there because we know that you have flaws. And this way, we'll use you as an excuse yeah. when God calls us to do something and you tell us something. You say, but yeah, you ain't perfect either. And this way we can live in a world of, of, of kind of whatever is in Christianity instead of experiencing him personally like he's called us to. So, so they try to play him. And so Moses goes up and sure enough, they play him. You know, they don't do what he says and we're going to do what you say and blah, blah, blah. And then all these consequences come from it. And then they trip out and they backslide away from God and they're mad at God as if God did something wrong. And God said, listen, do not set yourself on fire. Well, they set themselves on fire and they get mad they got burned. God said, well, I told you, you God, you did this to me. Oh, I created fire, but I told you to keep your hand on it. Right. You chose to stick your hand in there, so you get what you get. Don't throw a fit and don't come to me with your nonsense. Amen. See, this is the truth about Christianity. People do what you do and you get what you get. Then you freak out on God as if God did something wrong. No, you did. Why don't you just do what you're told? 
Boston, y'all don't like that. I'm full grown. You don't tell me nothing. I'm full grown. Well, if you're full grown, then why are you acting so immature and doing what you're not doing? Let me get back here. Um, start off the new year with bad thoughts. You're all right. Everybody be happy. Go home. It's good. We collected the tide. Y'all just go on about your business. Welcome to 2016. So here's what happened. He chose to rather memorialize Moses and Elijah from a different perspective than what human beings would have done. Although he was put them in a position of power, he did that spiritually so there would be no confusion or tampering by man's false sense of their purposes. Um, Pastor Chuck went to Israel not too long ago, and there in Israel he got to see where um, Jesus was born. He got to see where Jesus was crucified. Maybe the mountain, but not the spot. Okay? During the Middle Ages, Israel became kind of a destination for the wealth to see things. See what I'm saying? And so what they did was they would just say, well, it's close in the area. And then it was this guy's building. And this is where Jesus, you know, had a ham sandwich. And, uh, you know, this is where Jesus, you know, took a bath. And they memorialized these areas. They built churches on top of them and everything. But as you study archaeology, odds are that wasn't really the exact spot. Now, the Via Della Rosa, yes. Uh, the temple, yes. The things that are still in existence. But a lot of these areas were not actually the places that actually this stuff happened. Bones of the saints, you know, they collect the bone. They go, this is the saint. They didn't have DNA evidence. How do you know what? They used to bury people in multi levels. They would actually bury people on top of people because to bury somebody, you had to have money. So they put them on top of another. So how do you know? That that's Elijah or whoever else, St. Peter, or it could be just, you know, the gardener after they threw him aside, that wasn't a place to park him because they didn't want to put him, bury him in the backyard, you know? So they started to memorialize these things and make money off them. And they commercialized them. And so these places were not actually the places. They're in the general area, and some are, yes, but not a lot of them. Um, my, one of my archaeology professors said, you'd be amazed at how much of it is pure nonsense. And it's got 400 years of nonsense under its belt, and so therefore, if you tell, say something long enough, it's true, even if it isn't. See what I'm saying? And then it got protected as a holy place. So what happens is this. God didn't want that to happen with Moses and Elijah. Because people then will start to manipulate. So what he did was he took them off the earth, and he said, I don't want you to encounter these great men's lives, uh, or what they represented, uh, from a religious perspective of a place to go, because I want you to experience in them, experience in them, uh, or experience what they represented to you personally in your heart. Are you following? Are you tracking? All right. So, he says, I don't want you to make a religion out of them and call them saints to pray to, instead of praying to the God who sent them his messengers. You understand what I'm saying? All right. Man would make idols out of their burial places instead of going to the God who created them for their purpose. Their message, the law and the prophetic, was to be how we are to follow Jesus Christ. Through the law and the prophetic. Through the law and the prophetic. And what's interesting is that God allowed them to enter into this dimension because they did not earth. They didn't die in this dimension. In other words, because they didn't die on this earth, and he took them into the supernatural, he wanted human beings focused to be on the supernatural. See, people get off track very easily. You know, I believe we should respect this place. It's a holy place. But the holiness that makes this building what it is, is the people who worship here, not the building in itself. This is just brick and mortar. Right? And so understanding this about our Christian faith, I know a lot of people whose whole Christianity is based on attending church. And as if going to the building somehow makes you something. Instead of allowing what happens here in the building to make you something. Are you following? This year it's going to be very important that you step outside of your comfort zones of what you're used to. And step into something new. Or you're going to get the same thing you've got and you're not happy with. Man. I have one man in the back. All right. As I got one, I'll keep moving. What's interesting is that God allowed them to enter this dimension for a reason. Whenever I hear people say that they say lost a loved one and, and, and their loved one appeared to them, I have to explain to them that these are demonic manifestations 
to get them off of focus of the one who gave them that love, especially after the crucifixion. And here's why. When Jesus let all the old time prophets out of Abraham's bosom, a place in hell, where they were, not for punishment, but just waiting for Christ's appearing, um, he released them all for a reason. And there were phases. Now, no one in the Bible who died on this earth ever came back to the earth except Christ and one other person. Was anyone who also came, was risen up? Sin. And he spoke to who? Oh. From a witch of. That's right. So a witch conjured him up. He was slightly annoyed by this also. If you read the story. My point is, God is not looking for us to experience things that are dead or past. He's looking to have an encounter with us in the now. That was the purpose of the crucifixion. Now, to prove my point, when Moses and Elijah appeared with Christ in the mountain, the disciples said, let us build tents, temples, synagogues for the three of them. But God answered their request with, uh, uh, with an, a cloud that was not touched by man. So what I'm trying to show you is this. When we religiously try to memorialize places or people or things, you're an idol worship. You're not putting God as priority one. He is not the Lord of your life. And you are becoming religious instead of relational with the one who's trying to speak to you. It isn't just with a certain denomination. We all can do this. We can fall into a mode where we begin to worship how things are done. How our church services go. It should always be this way. We're going to have so many songs. Best friend will speak first. Then you can do this. You can do that. And what happens is that you fall into a mode where you become comfortable and you worship that moment. And if it goes outside of what you're comfortable with, then you feel you did not have church. But you're not supposed to have church. We're supposed to be the church. And in order to do that, we have to be living, moving, and active. And being able to experience God in a supernatural way. In which the whole service is not dependent on the worship and the preacher. But the encounter with who we're trying to bring you to through worship and the word. I hope you all are catching on on how this altar call is probably going to go in the end. I hope a few of you are locked in. Now, we're not to look to man to places or things to make contact with God, but we're, most, we're supposed to meet him with his glory. And that doesn't mean not coming to church. The Bible says, do not absent yourself from the assembling of believers. But it says that we are to encounter him as a relational being. So, God's glory cloud covers these three. God says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear me, Kim. So I hear God saying, we've got to include Bible, prophecy, and God's glory for us to experience this new experience he wants for us. Now, how do we experience God's glory? Through worship. When worship goes up, God's glory comes down. But worship is not singing songs. It's interacting with what's sung. I can sing any song, but that doesn't necessarily mean I'm worshiping because I'm not putting my effort, my emotion into it. It is important. Otherwise, it's very plain. If I tell my wife, I love you, that really has no flavor. It's just a word. But now if I hold a hand or your eyes and say, love See, that has more flavor. See what I'm saying? What flavor are you giving God? Because I believe that the white bread flavor he's been getting as of late is leaving a bad taste in his mouth. Are you following me? Yes. You're going to have to interact. Now, you say, well, Pastor, if you do this, then the people who just show up to hear a word and feel religious about themselves and put a handful of money in a tithe might leave. Good. Ah. Ah. My staff will back you. Get him out. Make room for someone who wants to get on fire for the Holy Ghost. Yes. I had a prophet, I had a professor who say to me, never get upset when there's wildfire in the church because there's always enough wet blankets to put it out. I say it's time to get rid of the wet blanket. Yes. If you don't like what we're saying, Please do us a favor and bless another church with your wonderful presence. Come on. It's all good. You won't hurt our feelings. Because what I found is nominal Christians, people who kind of mamby pamby with God, are like Doritos. God always makes more. We can get anybody to just 
sick in here. I mean, I can feel this place. Just start saying a bunch of nonsense. But we're looking for a certain caliber of person here. You say, well, that's very exclusive. We are. We are an exclusive club. We are a very exclusive club. We're so exclusive that we're actually looking for people who have a desire to be exclusively in love with Jesus. That's how exclusive we are. Come on, son. Don't know about that. He says, look, I've been trying for years to shrink this church. It don't bother me. Because I saw what Jesus did with just 12 men. On fire. You hear what I'm saying? Okay. When you just show up to hear something, we really don't want you here. We want people here who don't want to just hear something, but they want to be something yeah. that they hear. Yeah. See, that's the truth. Because when hard times come, and if we are in a battle, as the Bible says, the nominal people usually get in the way. I used the bodyguard, and um, whenever you were set up with a partner who didn't really know how to fight real well, they were more of a hindrance in a violent situation than a help. I won't mention any names or get into too much detail. <clears throat> but I got one time a call to go and handle a situation. I come out on three men, and my partner was not an aggressive. And so they, she began to scream and say, somebody call 911. And I looked at her and I said, you are the law. We're the law. She's trying to call for more backup. I said, you are my backup. But there's three of them. Yes, there are. And there's just two of us. You're absolutely correct. Your map is fantastic. <laughs> Wonderful. And so, in the way that the situation came out, as the gentleman decided to express themselves to me in a way that was less than polite, I had to make sure that I handled them and make sure that my partner was also protected. And she actually was in the way. So I moved her into a corner and threw her in a corner, and I handled it myself. Now, I said all that to say this. She was supposed to be and have my back. As we move forward in 2016, we're going to be dealing with all kinds of demonic influences, etc. You need to know who has your back spiritually. Okay? We need to know who's for real. We don't need nominals. Nominals don't. There's lots of other big churches that you can go to and get lost in and hide and pretend like you're playing church. Feel free. But this group of people, we plan on making a difference in 2016. Yeah. Yeah. And if you ain't got it like that, don't do it like that. Oh. And just be like the animal where you can walk on by. God bless you all. Pray. But I really believe God wants to use us at a level to affect the change in this community. We're going to be doing some pretty crazy stuff coming up. And so it's going to be really important that you understand who you are, who you are, and what authority you walk in. Right. And so this is really the message for 2016, is it's time to get for real. It really is. And I'm not trying to hurt nobody's feelings. But I really am not politically correct, so it doesn't matter to me. I found why be politically correct when you can be right. That's right. Come on. So, getting back. To recap, the Old Testament met the New Testament in the person of Christ on the mountain, where they were covered with the glory of God. And when it does, Jesus becomes the focus. Because what happened is, is when Peter says, let me make a tabernacle for these three, let us do this. God ignores his request. God doesn't even respond, but he responds with his glory instead. Showing that your little tent you were going to make or know how big your temple would be cannot really contain what you're dealing with. Your little tacit attempt at religion isn't going to cut it. So I'm going to pour my glory into this situation and show you that this is how you encapsulate the character and the person of who I am in Jesus Christ. Then, when Peter opens his eyes again, because the glory cloud is quite bright, all he sees is Jesus. So, after the glory, the focus becomes...
becomes Jesus. You ever notice after church or after a religious experience, you don't necessarily focus on Jesus. You usually focus on lunch. Or who cut you off trying to get out of the parking lot as fast as you can? Because you've got so much to do on your day off. What I'm saying is this. Is after we have these encounters, Jesus is going to become the central focus in this church. Because as we get into a time in which we're into our word, we're moving in the prophetic, and we're worshiping God, as that glory cloud begins to envelop us, when the glory cloud is lifted after each service, Jesus will be our focus. Because that's all that's going to say. I think I went too deep right off the bat. Man. We're in the fire of this message maybe in March. But you guys want to minute. When you have the Bible but no Jesus to direct you, you won't receive the information that you need. And this is why people get confused and they have problems because they don't really have Jesus. What they have is an idea of you know, their focus is askewed because they're trying to give to God what they feel they want to give Him instead of give to God what He demands, and that is to experience His glory. I believe it was Karl Marx, the father of communism, that memorized the whole book of John, if I read that correctly. Yet he was not a man of Christian faith. And he actually was used of Satan to create an extremely corrupt and oppressive governmental system that has oppressed people for years and spawned socialism in which the Nazi party came from. And this guy had memorized, well, how many people here have the whole book of John memorized? Good, you're safe. You know, create a demonic religion, so you're good. Um, or governmental system. Just because you can quote it doesn't mean you have any power. Because you don't know the Jesus who wrote it. So this is really what 2016 is all about. It's not just knowing what it says, but knowing the writer. See, there must be a supernatural in our life, along with the Word of God, to elicit true change that we need to be like Jesus. So reading the Word, but not supernaturally entering God's glory through prayer and the prophetic, leaves our vision of Christ a bit blurred. Is this happening? So there is a, the written word and the living word is how we receive revelation from God. General revelation from Psalm 19 says that the heaven declares the glory of God. So everyone has a general revelation that there is a God. There is no such thing as an atheist. I've said this a million times. There's no such thing. You stick a gun in their mouth, they always yell, oh my God. Works every time. Okay? What there is, though, is a sense that I don't want to accept God for who, we are, for who he is. And there are what I like to call Christian people. They acknowledge that he exists, that's the Christian side, but they have no real encounter with him, so they're still really atheistic. There's not much difference except they throw a lot of religious words over the top of really something that they don't truly believe anyways. Until they're pushed in front of us. Until someone gets canceled. Until someone sticks a gun in their face. Until there comes a moment in time where all of a sudden their theology and their religion changes. And they have to view things from a different perspective. Bob found a bullet that was shot up into the air for New Year's in our parking lot. What if that would have hit somebody? Faith is seen when you experience stuff like that. But should it be that way? Does God want us to be in trauma in order to come to a point where we draw to Him? Or does He look to allow the goodness of Himself to draw us? Why is there such a rebellion towards who He is? Why is there so much rebellion in your life towards Him? What's your problem? Really? I mean, can we just get for real? What is your problem? What has God done to you? That you choose to rebel against Him and then turn on Him when things don't turn out. What's the problem? See, I figured we might as well start off the year on a good foot. Because I really believe God is going to be doing such incredible things this year. 
And we've got to be for real to him. Amen. It's time to get for real. Amen. You ain't gonna like me. You ain't gonna love me. Okay. I just gotta do my job. It's okay, Pastor. Let me get back here. So he said, "There's general revelation, Psalm 19, because the heavens declare the glory of God." When you ask the astrophysicists, the, the atheists, the scientists, you ask them, "Where did all this come from? What's the telos? What's the start?" Uh, who's the one who's still alive? Uh, Hawkins, 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 whatever his name is. Not the guy in the wheelchair, the other guy who's still walking around and still has no excuse for being mad. God, what's his name? Dawkins. Dawkins says that we were dandruff on a meteor. And it smashed together. Now this man has his degree from Oxford and Harvard and we were dandruff on a meteor. Now how is it that we became dandruff on a meteor? But meteors don't have hair. <laughs> but we Christians are tripping about this whole Bible. Come on. Here's another question. If global warming is such a big problem, and there, we just had a, a really warm day now that they're trying to say, see, it's global warming. They said, we haven't had this temperature since 1881. And yet nobody catches on to that. And I'm fascinated. America is like so stupid. If it happened now, we're saying it's global warming because of industrialization. How is it that it happened before in 1880 before there was industrialization? How do they keep track of it then? Mm -hmm. I just was like, and we haven't had this. 1860 was the last time we had this. Time. How would you know? Well, we kept track of it. Well, was it global warming back then too? So then it's a cycle that the earth just kind of globally warms over time. It has nothing to do with industry and making money off it. Oh, I'll get back to the Bible here. Unless the black helicopters show up and I'll be taken away. <laughs> so there's regular revelation and common sense, which we just discussed. And then there is this supernatural information, which I want to address. From the generic to the specific. See, if you want to experience what the disciples experienced on the mountain, you have to expose yourself to his glory and to his written word through a relationship with his son that is not based on all of your questions of why he doesn't do what you want. I'll repeat that. Your relationship with God cannot be based on the fact that he doesn't answer all your questions the way you want. I'm amazed when people have this type of relationship with God. As if he owes you something. He don't owe you Jack. He don't owe you Jill. Okay? You owe him. Every heartbeat is the gift that he gives. He can stop. We've lost a few people this year. And um They were given life by God, and God took that life and brought them home. God gets to decide. So if God can decide when you live and die, He's also going to probably have total say over your life once you commit it. So how do you have the right to see Him? If we don't put God in proper perspective, the way most TV preachers are preaching, you're going to become a little deluded and frustrated when you're feeling that God is always out to bless you and give you what you want, the desires of your heart. I agree with all of that. But he'll give you all of those things if you seek him first. Then all of those things will be added yes. unto you. Not if you seek those things. And by the way, I'll go to church on Sunday and do a deal. I just talked with a guy. Convinced about Jesus and everything else. And uh, he says, well, I'm, I'm, I'll come to your church. I said, look, man, you got this wrong. I don't give out Kool-Aid. I don't wear sunglasses. I'm not building a cult. I'm not trying to get you to come to my church. I'm getting you, I want to get you to know my Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay, you got it all twisted. I can convince anybody. But convincing you is not my issue. Seeing you transform into the image of Christ is the issue. So if this church gets a lot bigger or 
bigger, it gets smaller. That's not my issue. That can't be my issue. My issue is that I preach the truth and that people come to know Christ and experience it. That's the reality of Christianity. So, we're going to do something a little different today. If the sound booth would, of course, put on uh, something appropriate, we're looking to do something different. I even stopped at 12. Because um, I want the staff pastors to come forward uh, this morning. Now, if you're new, you'll think this is normal and good, because this probably is going to become more normative than you. The question today that God wants to know, or wants you to know, or wants you to ask yourself, because he already knows. Um, is this. How many people here want to see him experience him at a supernatural level? that will hold you accountable for the rest of your life to live up to what you experience. Come on. Wow. I have had ample opportunities to leave the ministry. But in 1988, God spoke to me in an automobile, pinned me to the ground, and kept me there all night long, two days in a row. No matter how much I'd like to deny that that happened, If you're at a point where you would like, better yet, if you're at a point where you need, come on. Then today is your day. God says I'm going to be doing some miracles. I'm going to be meeting you. He might meet you here in the next few minutes. He might meet you later on tonight. We can get your attention. But you really want to meet him. You want to push past. You realize the importance of it. Then I want you to just raise your hand. 